No, no, this oh. is, well, one of them, but, okay. all right, so, it's a clue, by the way. Um, so this is the... It's a clue. It is the same picture you showed. It, is, it is a different girl, actually. The, if you remember, the last week's girl was blonde. Um, wow, I don't remember. But she, she's blonde. Not really. She's blonde. She's not really blonde. Kind of brown. I just like happy doctors. I just like happy doctors. And happy patients, the girl in the back. Look how happy that patient is. She's very happy to be there. The guy that looks like House doesn't, he doesn't look too, too happy to be there. But anyway, so here we go. Uh, patient presentation, 78 year old, white male, past medical history, pretty sick, coronary artery disease, he's had a stent, sick sinus syndrome, he's an AFib, has a pacemaker, just heart failure with the junction fraction 33.5%, hypertension, chronic kidney disease, obstructive sleep apnea on CPAP, gout. Uh, he's transferred here from Northwest Regional Medical Center in Clarksdale. Uh, with the left, uh, left upper extremity swelling and pain that began the night prior, and ID is consulted as an emergency consult. Is that near your hometown? No. Where, what is your hometown? It lies in Michigan. Boonville. It's Michigan. Boonville. Whatever. You're about, Mississippi. You're about three and a half hours from Clarksdale if you drive. MS. Okay. Clarksdale, Mississippi. Clarksdale is close to Cleveland, however. Anyway. So, so vitals on admission. Pretty close to the same as. You can see he's pretty septic, temperature is 39.2, blood pressure 68 over 45, heart rate 140, respiratory rate is 18. He is intubated, 794%, on 60% of bio 2 on vent. So, physical exam, uh, this is for the initial consult note. I actually wasn't the one who initially saw this patient. But, uh, so he's brought in, intubated, and sedated. The left arm is bowel smelling, necrotic, cold, no palpable radial or ulnar pulse. Someone gets a Doppler, tries to Doppler a pulse, and they cannot Doppler a pulse in that left upper extremity. There's several hemorrhagic bullae, just proximal, up to proximal the elbow, and it's noted that it is spreading rapidly, as I will show you in pictures. It is noted at Clarksdale, the patient actually came in with an INR5, if you remember he was on Coumadin at home for his AFib, uh, received FFP and, and vitamin K at Clarksdale. They also checked the CT head uh, because his mental status was poor and they were worried about spontaneous bleed. CT head did not show a spontaneous bleed. This is his arm. Um, okay, it shows up pretty good up there. So, dusky in appearance, necrotic, and bleeding from these hemorrhagic bullet. Um, this other picture, and I'll show it to you later. Actually, you see the two lines. The span uh, between these two lines is three hours. So, as you can see, it's, it's still advancing proximal. And there's a better picture of that. So, uh, here's his initial labs. Um, initially, blood, AFB, fungal culture, urine culture is initially negative. C diff negative. CRP is 294. Lactic acid 5.1. INR is 2.3, so they got it down. Um, ABG is there. Creatinine is elevated 3.17. Baseline is about 1.6. Uh, but those labs, that baseline is from uh, about two years back. Um, patients immediately taken to the OR for guillotine amputation for suspected neck fash. Um, and like I talked told you before, surgery notes the erythema had spread within three hours. So, and that, just to show you again. So the thing is rapidly progressing, whatever it is he has. Was he, a, was, was he alert when he presented? He's intubated. So when he went to the hospital in Clarksdale, he was confused and had been getting. He was. He went to bed the night before, saying, "I don't feel good. My arm kind of hurts." Then his family said he was kind of confused and not thinking appropriately the next morning. And that's when they took him to Clarksdale, yeah. which is in the Mississippi Delta, just across the river from Helena, Arkansas. And so they tried to transfer him up to vascular surgery, and they said, "But with his mentation and the coagulopathy, we want to scan his head." So scan his head. And they spent most of the day that Saturday getting him transferred. So, so pain was a predominant part of his presentation. Initially, it was yeah. mostly pain. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, pain and swelling. So, I'll, I'm going to talk more about that. So, a little bit, and this is after amputation. Boy, did so they go far enough? They did. Maybe not far enough though. A little more info on the guy. He works as a commercial fisherman. Was catfish fishing in a freshwater lake prior to admission. Uh, began initially as left wrist pain and swelling, and then by the morning. What's that? Oh, I'm going to talk about this. Crazy people. Everyone in the water. No, he won. He was 
He won middling. I've been there, done that. Alright, this is on tape. This is going on YouTube, just to remind everybody. All of your comments will be heard. So what organisms should you guys be concerned about? Any thoughts? Bipro. That's a good thought. Usually it's sea water, I guess, but every every Yep. What is your What did Victor say? What did you say, Victor? Is that what you said? Uh-huh. What about Aramonas? It's a good thought. Edward Cielo. Edward is also a good thought. Anything else? Well, if you're in the Gulf, uh, He's not in the Gulf. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. Gulf of Mexico, Vibrio, very common, Chesapeake Bay. Might go back to your Marin and wouldn't be that rapid. And but you should keep that in your differential. Yeah. Rocket. Okay. So, the present this is when dinner kills. A smattering of skin and soft tissue infections. And I'm very happy to say that everything that you guys mentioned in your differential I'll be talking about. Yes! Score. I guess we shouldn't have mentioned that much. <laughs> <laughs> so, you just mentioned mycobacterium. It was a good thought. Um, like you mentioned, usually doesn't get that kind of spread, right? So, but anyway, for boards, you get a patient that comes in with a uh, uh, purulent lesion on his fish tank clean in hand or his pool swim in leg. So, the old classification of, of TB, if you guys remember, it's a running group one, grows in intermediate, gro or intermediate growth rate. Um, typically it infects sites where you have some sort of pre-existing abrasion uh, and these people are exposed to water typically with fish or you can even get it from you know any sort of water or fish related injury so uh, it comes up about two or three weeks later usually a solitary lesion so a lot of people have some trouble differentiating this from sporotrichosis but sporotrichosis if you remember is usually like groups of lesions and travels with like linear streaks of the arm uh, can cause tenosynovitis, chronic arthritis, um, that's more rare. Um, when you're culturing it, this is a, an important point I picked up, it grows at cooler temperatures. So your initial culture should be, you should get them at two t different temperatures, one at 30 and one at 37. Because uh, mycobacterium can actually grow as low as 24 centigrade. So, um, And that, interestingly enough, is why it's usually confined in the distal extremities, so cooler parts of the body. Uh, and it takes about seven or ten days to grow up. So here's a picture of some of the lesions from Mycobacterium marina. Okay. Um, drugs that you would use for management. Usually you use two drugs um, if it's severe disease, so multiple lesions. Uh, and localized debridement. These are some of the things that you can use. Clorithromycin, ethambutol, used commonly. Um, you could, if it's a isolated minor infection, you can do a single drug therapy, something like Ceftra or Doxy. Uh, treatment is prolonged. So. Uh, Ed, Edward Ciela, someone had mentioned. Sure. Uh, so it's gram negative rod, facultative anaerobe, anaerobacteriaceae family, also uh, colonizes guts of catfish, generally causes diarrheal illness in humans, uh, but can cause skin abscesses, sepsis. Um, it's a, actually a much larger problem in the fish population. It's been responsible for decimating populations of fish, causes hemorrhagic sepsis in fish. Uh, like some of the other organisms I'm going to talk about, needs iron to live. So it has different ways to obtain iron from a host, including siderophores and hemolysin to shred your RBCs and get the hemoglobin. So um, these are some of the cases. You can see it's somewhat somewhat rare, this is for, um, cases actually in a six year span, there are only 11 in this hospital in New Orleans. So, but you can see the different ways that people get this, and also different uh, areas, including a tubo ovarian abscess, which I found to be rather odd. But um, mainly people who had been exposed to water, like one person stepped on fish bones, one person had an arm wound and fell into brackish water. And brackish, if you guys remember, is, uh, water that is not quite fresh water, not quite salt, um, ocean water, so it has some salinity. Um, but the uniform thing is a lot of these folks were had some sort of water exposure. So um, Treatment, also again, susceptible to a lot of different antibiotics, Cipro, Ampicillin, Beta-Lactams, severe cases, required debridement. Uh, Vibrio, something I mentioned, so it's gram-negative, curved rod, free lives in the water, 
uh, in coastal populations, actually uh, 0.5 per 100,000 per year are affected with this and is the number one cause of shellfish-related death in humans. So a lot of people associate this with eating raw oysters. And you may say, why does that happen? Um, oysters are, are somewhat of an interesting part of the life cycle of Vibrio when it comes to human infection. So oysters feed by filtering water. So they're going to siphon in a big amount of, of ocean water. Well, the bact it basically concentrates Vibrio within the oyster because it's constantly filtering the water. Um, and the Vibrio actually undergoes a colony change in the oyster, it's been shown, that makes it pathogenic to humans. And I'll talk about that. So the highest risk people for getting severe disease are people who eat raw oysters and have concurrent liver disease, i.e. Jimmy Buffett fans. So, uh, so Vibrio, like Edward Ciela, also thrives on iron. So um, people who have higher amounts of iron in their circulation are much more prone to getting severe infections. So proportional to the saturation of transferrin with iron. So patients with hemochromatosis, chronic hepatitis, who typically will have higher iron levels can get potentially fatal sepsis. So um, greater than 90% of people when they go back and, and look at cases, uh, greater than 90% of people had consumed raw oysters. So, um, so, and you can get cutaneous vibrio from shucking oysters, cleaning fish, or uh, if you have a pre-existing wound and you get exposed to any sort of infected water. So, remember, it's a free living organism, so. Okay, so these are some pictures. Um, the, the reason I wanted to show this to you is the, these patients, the one on the left has liver disease, so does the one on the right. Um, and then that's vibrio in the corner. So, and you can see sort of the differentiation between people and the severity of illness correlating with liver disease. And many people think this is secondary to the iron, um, where Vibrio will divide and grow like crazy with higher amounts of iron. So, liver disease on the right, no liver disease on the left, and you see the bullous lesions that I was telling you about. So, I found this guide, it was actually in like the South Carolina ID Society over there that led, was a guide for just the general lay people about Vibrio because the amount of raw oyster eating over there. And I guess people think that if you put oysters and they smother it with hot sauce, that it kills Vibrio, but apparently the MIC for hot sauce is pretty high. So, um, I also... Do you have any horseradish data? Horse, no, I didn't actually. I have to send that. I have to send that. So. Actually, how about alcohol? Because that's another that method. that actually is on this list, but I couldn't crop it right. <laughs> they're like, if I get drunk and eat right. oysters, is that okay? And they're like, alcohol does not do affect this at all. But it would be really funny if they said it did. A additionally, Jimmy Buffett music does not actually have any correlation. So. Um, you can't smell it, can't taste it. You don't know if a fresh oyster is infected or one that is not so fresh is infected. So, and yes, you can get it as, they said, as few as three oysters um, were enough to kill somebody, so. All right, so the virulence, there, I'm not gonna go into great detail about this, but it's something I found somewhat, interested, somewhat interesting. And I was telling you about oysters and the life cycle and how it infects humans, right? That oysters are particularly important. Well, Vibrio is very widespread in ocean waters, but the number of infections doesn't really correlate with the number of people that would be exposed to it. So why is this? So there's a lot of different biotypes, but only a few of them that cause infections in humans. And uh, the Vibrio that's pathogenic produces a capsule, a polysaccharide capsule, that prevent, uh, protects against phagocytosis and opsonization. When they put non-capsulated uh, Vibrio in, mouse, in mice, they do fine. When they put the capsulated Vibrio in mice, they get these bullous infections, sepsis, and die. So the capsule has something to do with it. And the thought is it produces a TNF response, so that's where you get this big systemic uh, reaction to it. But what I found really interesting is that um, the colonies will tend not to be encapsulated until they're actually taken in by oysters. So when they get concentrated in oysters, there's some sort of uh, quorum sensing that goes on that actually converts the population to encapsulated. Um, and then you subsequently eat them. Uh, and then produces different toxins. Again, I talked about how important it is for, the, for Vibrio to obtain iron. So this RTX toxin can perforate your RBCs. And like I said, hemolysin, sterophores, also has lipopolysaccharide. All these things 
um, contributing to its toxicity. So, um, grows on standard culture. The treatment of choice is doxy and septaz, uh, but you can also use as your alternative to use cipro, uh, cefotax, cefotaxime, or minnow. Um, sepsis in oops. Okay. Um, in liver patients, I was, I was showing you the pictures before, the disease is extremely severe. Uh, if a patient has concurrent vibrio, uh, sepsis, and chronic liver disease, uh, it's a 50% mortality rate. So, And then for all the oyster lovers, I looked up on the FDA, uh, how can you be safe? So if you have closed oysters, you pull them right out of the ocean, you want to boil them until they open, and then from there, boil them in another five minutes. If you're steaming them, steam until they open, steam for another nine minutes. Interestingly enough, if they are already open, so you boil them only for three minutes or fry for 10 and at least 350 degrees. And then you will be safe. And then they'll boil them on one again. Yeah, exactly. And now we come to the bacterium that I can't pronounce. Erysipathyroryx. Erysipathyroryx or the obatia. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. Just I, whenever I come to it, I want you to say it. So. Sure. All right. So it's a gram-positive gram bacillus. Lives in a lot of different uh, animals. It's associated with people who work with these animals. So uh, the most common infection is this erysipeloid of Rosenbach, and I always like to include a little bit of medical history in all my presentations. So Rosenbach is a German doc who was actually the first one to describe strep pyogenes and was the first one to differentiate between Staph aureus and Staph aureus. He's also the first one to describe this erysipeloid um, skin lesion. So localized pain and swelling two to seven days after exposure. You usually don't get any fever from it if it's localized. Um, typically the people who get this are people who work with animals, will have pre-existing skin breaks, and then get it from the animal. So um, People who work with pigs seem to be the people who get it the most often, but that may be just because so many people work with pigs. It's just an animal that's farmed considerably. So I got a picture of this, and this is a this picture actually has a story behind it. So this is a picture of that erysipelas of Rosenblum rash. So, but this picture, do you guys know where this came from, or do you, any of you recognize it? This was just recently. So there's a case in Tennessee actually, where this kid got it from um, sticking his hand in the uh, touch, touch the Fish Aquarium at the Tennessee Aquarium. So if you guys have been to Tennessee Aquarium, they have like a stingray pool and they have little fish there that you can go and you can pet the fish and hopefully they don't kill you. Um, but in this case, this kid uh, put his hand in the touch tank and a week later uh, developed Erysipelas, and they are suing the Tennessee Aquarium for $2.4 million. So this was actually last month. So he grew out um, the Erysipelarynx within six days. And remember I said it usually takes about between two and seven. So that's about right. Uh, they tested their waters and could not find evidence of it, but I don't know how the kid would get it otherwise. But and they're rethinking that. The, uh, the touch tank, the touch tank, yeah, yeah, but th this is pretty interesting and it's local to us, so I found out about that, I'm like, wow, that's really cool, so, um, like I said, systemic infection, it's rare, um, but it can resemble sepsis, you can get diffuse cutaneous involvement, uh, this organism actually can cause endocarditis, um, has a pr propensity for aortic valve, typically in people who have septic they will initially have the, the erysipelas rash, develop sepsis, and then they, those patients can potentially develop endocarditis. So um, the important thing to remember is if you have a patient with endocarditis and you're suspecting this, ask them if they had that erysipeloid rash beforehand. 40% of them will be positive. And then it's 38% uh, fatality rate. So treatment is pe penicillin is your drug of choice still. Uh, I've included some alternatives there. Um, for local cutaneous infection, you can use oral penicillin, Cipro or Clindo for seven days. And then systemic disease, IV penicillin. Alternatively, you can use imipenem, ceftriaxone, Clindo, Dapto. But this, this is a very important point I have up there in case you get this on your boards or research or whatever. So it's vancomycin resistant. So if you're treating some sort of sepsis, gram-positive sepsis, endocarditis, et cetera, and it is not responding to vanc, 
consider this in your differential. All right, so we come upon our last organism here. So the murder weapon is on the left there. It was either this or a fish hook. So do you guys know what that is? That is a penny. That is correct. It is, it is a, it is not, well, it is not exactly a fish bone in the traditional sense. It is a catfish spine. So catfish have three of these things. Two on, one on each side of its head and one on its dorsal fin. Now what catfish do as a defensive mechanism is when you catch it, it likes to thrash itself about. And what it's doing is trying to jab you with one of its barbs. These barbs are coated with a slime. The slime is loaded with bacteria, and the bacteria it is loaded with is pictured on the right. Do you guys know what that is? I guess the only one left is Aromonas. Yeah, yeah, go with process of uh, exclusion. Yeah, Aromonas hydrophilia. So, going back to Aromonas, so gram negative rod, salt, and fresh water. Uh, what's interesting, you'll find some infections in people who get medicinal leeches. So, and the reason this is, leeches have Aromonas colonizing their gut. And they need it to live. Aromonas is responsible for the breakdown of the blood uh, so that le leeches can process blood for nutrition. So people who use leeches for medicinal reasons, such as with flap surgery or uh, localized anticoagulation in things like ear, um, some of them have developed Aromonas skin infections. Just as a quick aside, we actually have a leech therapy protocol for when we do use medicinal leeches and they're supplied from medical supply houses and it calls for the patients to receive prophylactic ciprofloxacin while they're getting their leech therapy because of this. Absolutely. So causes, again, causes hemorrhagic septicemia and bleeding ulcers in fish like the ones I told you about. Besides leeches, you get a penetrating injury from fish handling like our patient who either got it from uh, mishandling a catfish or potentially got it from a fish hook. Um, so cellulitis develops within 8 to 24 hours, rapid necrosis, myositis, and fasciitis. Mean, mean thing. So I'm going to talk about some really interesting outbreaks. So one of the outbreaks occurred in 2002. Uh, so in Australia, they were having a mud arena football match. They pumped water from a local nearby river to create this mud arena, and 100 people wrestle in the mud. Subsequently, 26 of them go to the hospital because they're developing pustules and all sorts of red nasty stuff. Three of the 26 are cultured. I don't know why they didn't culture more, and all of them grow out aromonas. So um, these patients, it, it took time for the cultures to come back. So uh, they were all sent home with incorrect antibiotic therapy. Uh, and they had to call these patients back to make sure that they got correct antibiotic therapy. A few of them actually required and developed severe infections likely due to multiple cuts that were infected and required debridement. They were treated with Cipro and Septra as outpatients. Uh, another really cool case, uh, this is very Hausian. I love this. So a 42-year-old man comes in with dysuria and urgency beginning 24 hours before. So 12 hours later, begins having progressive severe left flank pain, rating down to his left groin, associated with nausea and chilliness, no emesis, fever, associated bowel changes or urethral discharge is present. Physical examination reveals a healthy man who is in moderate distress. His temperature is 102.2. Left CVA tenderness is present. Present general urinary exam revealed a right tender swollen epididymis consistent with acute epididymitis. The remainder of the exam is unremarkable. White blood cell count was 14,000, 85% neutrophils, 8% bands. Hemoglobin levels 15, platelet count is 212,000. I'm gonna skip a little bit and just go to the meat and potatoes. Cultures of blood obtained, admission yielded Aromonas hydrophilia, and his antibiotic therapy is adjusted to Cipro. Five days after admission, discharge in the ephemeral condition, near resolution of testicular pain, and complete resolution of his other complaints. Further history elicited from the patient when the Aromonas species was identified revealed that he had been in an Arizona resident for many years and he had not had recent contact with any lakes, rivers, or streams. He did admit to having sexual intercourse in his residential pool with his wife in the 24 hours before the onset of his symptoms. The wife never became ill. The patient noted that his pool had not been cleaned or chemically serviced for three weeks. Follow-up cultures of specimens from the pool, adjacent whirlpool, and the pond in the yard were all positive for Aromonas hydrophilia. So they did the house thing, went to the guy's house, and cultured his pool. So treatment. 
uh, gent, tobra, septra, cipro, rocephin, tetracyclines can all be used. Uh, Zosin, it's kind of a mixed bag. 50% of isolates that were tested in the paper I was reading were resistant to it. So severe infections tend to be in immunocompromised individuals like our patient, elderly, uh, congestive heart failure, sick sinus syndrome, and lots of other medical problems, and they need rapid surgical treatment. So going back to our patient, initially started bank, so Clinda. Surgical cultures brought Hermonas. Cipro is subsequently added, um, but the patient decompensates further. So he requires pressors, develops ATN, he has to get dialyzed, he has difficulty weaning off the vent, and when they do, he never uh, actually returns to a normal mental status. Uh, the palliative, palliative care is consulted, family wants comfort care, antibiotics are stopped on the 12th, and he dies the 15th. 